you don't think I'll make these ladies sick, do you? And he said, no, now if we men were staying, we'd be the ones that run out and be sick because yes. these ladies have a strong stomach. But uh, thank you all for having me today. Uh, like Danny said, I've had a little hard. I do work at Sycamore Shoals, and mostly we talk about uh, the Revolutionary War time period, Sycamore Shoals, but we do have some uh, Civil War uh, history that we share in there as well. And, uh, so I thought that when Jenny asked me to speak on the battlefield in Balmy, I said, are you sure about this? I said, this is a lunch meeting, you know. Uh, but no, we're going, I'm, I'm not going to be too gruesome. Uh, uh, what I will do is that if anybody have, has any questions about any of the equipment or the procedure or anything like that, you can come up and talk to me after you all adjourn and we'll do it that way so we don't um, go too much into detail about how the process is done. But I thought I would talk today about um, who were the embalmers during the Civil War and, and the, whole, um, the whole process that way. But we really can't talk about embalming unless we mention the Egyptians. They were the first ones to really uh, be interested in preserving uh, human flesh, uh, preserving bodies, because it was a uh, religious uh, ritual for them. They believed that uh, the body, would, or the spirit would re-enter the body a thousand years after it had died, and so to preserve the body as best they could uh, was very important to them because it was a, a religious practice for them. The word embalm means to uh, to preserve um, or to put on balm, uh, meaning just to uh, give a sweet scent uh, or to preserve. Uh, we all know that the Egyptians, uh, their embalming procedure produces mothers, and we all know what that looks like, and they've seen that on the field. And it's amazing how 4,000 years a person can be preserved with a lot of their physical features that can be recognized uh, so many years later. Um, the practice of embalming was rarely done by early Christians. Um, they just allowed their, their dead to decay down. Uh, but there are some instances of some of the knights during the Crusades that were uh, crudely embalmed to be sent home uh, for burial uh, during, the, during the time of the Crusades. Um, the, the, the man who really started the process of embalming as we know it today was a Frenchman by the name of Jean Genal, and uh, he was an apothecary's assistant in France uh, during the late 1700s. And he developed a process where he would inject aluminum salts into the veins of deceased people, and that helped to uh, stave off uh, decay. And he was really the first person to uh, provide embalming to the public uh, in, in the early 19th century in France. Um, embalming was not popularized in America until the time of the Civil War. And, uh, mostly because of the vast number of casualties during the war and the need for the families to have their uh, deceased loved ones sent home for a proper Christian burial. And uh, that really facilitated the need for embalming. Um, most of the uh, surgeons and doctors that were attached to military units during the war were the first ones to uh, start the embalming practices because they already had a, a, a good knowledge of uh, anatomy and so they could, uh, could embalm pretty easily. Um, they used chemicals uh, such as arsenic, uh, creosote, mercury, turpentine, and other forms of alcohol, but uh, formaldehyde as we know is what's used mostly today. Uh, was not developed until 1866 after the war, so formaldehyde did not, was not used as an embalming agent uh, during the war. Most of it was arsenic based. Um, these, uh, these surgeons were called embalming surgeons, um, and most of them, a lot of them, um, would resign their commission as a uh, 
military surgeon because there wasn't any money. But there was money in the, in, in the embalming. And they were to charge a great amount of money for, to embalm a, a soldier. And as you can imagine, they would probably charge more for an officer than an enlisted man because they knew that the families could afford to pay for it. Uh, it was mostly a northern uh, phenomenon in embalmers. Uh, the, the chemicals were produced in the northern uh, uh, companies. Uh, it was, you'll, you'll be real hard pressed to find uh, embalmers in the south during the war, mainly because it was just so hard to get the chemicals through the blockades. Um, but there are some instances where uh, southern officers were embalmed by uh, federal bombers the same as at home, but it's very rare uh, that you'll find that. Uh, most of these men were were pretty honest, but there were a lot who were very unscrupulous and would take advantage of the families um, because the, the need for a, for a Christian burial outweighed the price, and so they would pay it no matter what uh, to bring the, the locals home. And there are lots of instances where you find uh, embalmers, what they were called, following the war. And they would go follow the troops from battle to battle and set up these makeshift tents and, and embalming parlors, as they call it, um, after the battles. Uh, it would be uh, a sight after the battles to see, it would be uncommon to see three or four embalmers out on the battlefield looking for officers. Uh, so that they could uh, get the bodies and bomb them in hopes of making uh, a lot of money uh, on the families of the, of the soldiers, uh, the officers mostly. Um, of course, Washington, D.C. was the capital of the federal government, and uh, um, a lot of embalmers set up shop in Washington, D.C. Um, because of all the rail traffic coming through the, the capital city. They, they became such a nuisance that so many embalmers were setting up shop in Washington City that they had to be run out of town. Uh, they were just becoming, you know, there were more <coughs> embalming parlors than, than taverns in Washington, D.C. Uh, so a lot of them were run out of town, and that's when they really started following the war, going from, from battle to battle to, uh, to get their business. Um, so you can imagine what kind of a reputation some of these some of these men had. One story that I want to share with you about a young soldier that was involved it comes from a, a article in the Civil War Courier. And this is by Trevor Steinbach. He portrays a, a, a battlefield surgeon. And I'll just read that to you. Joshua S. Smith, a corporal of Company G, 5th Regiment, Wisconsin Volunteers, died in the hospital in Washington, D.C. The evening before his death, Captain Bew visited him and found him, as he supposed, very much improved, so much so that he expected to be able to join his company in two or three days. The next morning, Captain Bew learned, to his great surprise, that the young officer was dead. Captain Bew had the body embalmed and expressed home. In a letter from Captain Bew, he described the manner in which the embalming was done. The body was rendered new and placed in a horizontal position on the platform. A very small incision was made on the left arm to get to a vein. A tube was inserted in the vein and attached to a pump. The pump was set in a vessel containing two gallons of a prepared fluid, and this fluid was injected into the blood vessels. Before the commencement of the operation, the face was very much emaciated, and the body was quite reduced. But in a few seconds later, after the commencement of the embalming process, the blood vessels began to enlarge, the face became full, and the whole body assumed a lifelike and healthy appearance. So uh, that was that arsenic that was being pumped into the veins, and it would just give a pink, uh, youthful complexion to the, to the body. And it was very much a, uh, a happy uh, occasion when these families would see their, their loved ones come home to see how good they looked. And uh, so uh, uh, the ones who would do it right made, did a lot of business because they could uh, make the body look so, uh, so lifelike. 
the person that we uh, recognize as the father of modern uh, embalming is a, a doctor by the name of Thomas Holmes. And he stumbled upon a, uh, a type of embalming uh, using arsenic, and it was um, advertised as a safe and unharmful process. <laughs> arsenic. <laughs> where he would add four ounces of arsonist acid to a gallon of water for the uh, embalming fluid. Uh, not much is known about Dr. Holmes' early life, but we do know that he studied in New York at the Medical College. Uh, and by 1850, he was uh, um, practicing his new embalming technique uh, all around. Uh, it is rumored that Dr. Holmes uh, embalmed over 4,000 bodies uh, after uh, just a few weeks. And modern uh, uh, scientists say that that's just impossible for that, for that to happen. I don't know. Um, Dr. Holmes gained uh, much fame when he was invited uh, by President Lincoln to embalm the body of Colonel Ellsworth. Uh, Ellsworth had worked in uh, Lincoln's law office in Springfield, Illinois, and when the officer was a good friend of Lincoln, and when he died, uh, he invited Holmes to come and embalm the body, and they had a funeral service for Ellsworth there at the White House. Uh, Mrs. Lincoln made the comment that the body looked so natural it looked just like it was, uh, it was asleep, and uh, this would come into play for her uh, in decisions that she would have to make very soon after that because her son Willie died in 1862, and she had Dr. Harry Cattell and Dr. Brown of Pennsylvania Avenue, the bombers right there in, in uh, Washington, embalmed her son. Uh, <clears throat> after Ellsworth's funeral, uh, Dr. Holmes' services were highly in demand, and he began uh, to patent his own uh, embalming fluid, at which he charged $3 a gallon. Uh, you can imagine $3 was a lot of money. At that time, and it was uh, a lot of it was sold. Uh, and I thought this was unique for uh, Mr. Holmes. I'll just read this here. Following the war, he returned home to Brooklyn, New York, but did very little embalming after that. Oddly enough, before his death in 1900, he requested that his body not be embalmed. <laughs> trade was also practiced directly on the battlefield, as we mentioned before. They would set up tents or they'd use some nearby building to embalm the dead. Uh, at some, some occasions, and this is a, a true number, but there would be as many as 100 bodies uh, waiting for the, for the embalming surgeon to, to do his job. Uh, sometimes it was very easy for, this, for the embalmer to do their work because the uh, carnage of the battlefield would, would usually have the bodies, they would already be drained of their blood, so you didn't have to worry about that. It was just a process of pumping in the embalming fluid. And so it would take about a couple of hours, and that would be it for the body to be embalmed. It was usually placed in, a, uh, in an iron box, uh, lined with zinc. Uh, their effects would be placed in the box with them. And if they did have some type of identifying mark uh, on their uniform, or sometimes they would even resort to pinning little cards inside their coat. Uh, but uh, some soldiers, if they were lucky, uh, had a, a, a tag issued to them, a uh, predecessor of the modern day dog tag. Uh, it was a little copper disc that their unit number and their name and, and would be punched into it. But most of the time, the soldiers were so concerned about if they died, they wanted to be returned home to their families. So they would just take a little piece of wood, they would write their name on it, write their hometown on there, and then maybe write their uh, their unit and which company they were with so that their body could be returned home to their families. Uh, after, after the, the, kind of a sobering thought, you know, to have a only person uh, knowing what it would be used for. Um, <coughs> a little bit about um, the cost of embalming. We mentioned it was expensive, but for Dr. Holmes, uh, he charged, at the beginning of the war, he charged uh, $50 for an officer, 
$25 for an enlisted man, uh, but by the end of the war he was charging $80 for an officer and $30 for an enlisted man. Um, after the war, shortly after the war, he resigned his commission with the Army as a surgeon, and he began to charge $100 for the bombing. So you can imagine, $100 in the 1860s, that was a small portion. Um, who knows the name of the first president to be involved? Family? It's not a trick question. <laughs> um, of course, we all know that Lincoln was uh, assassinated at uh, Ford's Theater, and uh, uh, Mary Todd once again called on the embalmers to, uh, to uh, embalm her husband. Um, the, the same embalmers that uh, embalmed, no, excuse me. Yeah, the same embalmers that uh, embalmed her son, Willie, uh, embalmed President Lincoln as well. Um, I'll just read uh, a little bit here uh, from the article. Now, Mr. Lincoln was the first president to be embalmed. It was the request of Mrs. Lincoln uh, after seeing Colonel Ellsworth's uh, youthful complexion in the casket that reminded her of, uh, of what the embalming can do. Uh, it was Dr. Brown and Dr. Cattell that uh, embalmed the president. Uh, Dr. Brown's advertisements touted that the bodies he embalmed would be kept in the most perfect and natural preservation, a claim that would be put to the test uh, on the Lincoln funeral train. To keep the body in the condition that the embalmers had promised, Dr. Cattell traveled with the funeral party, and you know the procession of miles and miles and miles to the back where was uh, buried. Um, Dr. Cattell traveled with the funeral party, providing the president's body with touch-ups along the way. <coughs> After the war, Dr. Brown quit embalming and took up dentistry in New York City. Dr. Cattell also quit and became a lithographer and then a policeman on the Washington, D.C. police force. He never told his family. Um, so that's just a little bit about um, the very little known process of embalming in the Civil War. It's even kind of taboo today. We don't like to talk about uh, things like that, but uh, I can imagine that it was very comforting for the families that uh, were able to get their loved ones returned home uh, to have their, their loved ones involved. I became interested in the uh, Civil War era Embalming. Last year, uh, our uh, Sons of Confederate Veterans uh, camp, uh, the John F. Morgan camp down in Greenville, uh, hosted the uh, reenactment of Morgan's death at uh, uh, the Dixon Williams Mansion back in September. And uh, John Hunt Morgan, General Morgan, of course, was killed there in the yard at Dixon Williams Mansion, and his body was embalmed inside the Dixon Williams Mansion there. It was one of the few Confederate soldiers to be embalmed. Uh, we don't know the name of the man who embalmed him. They just figured he might have been a doctor maybe there in, in Greenville. Um, but uh, we, uh, I thought, well, how neat that would be to show that side of the story. So I, a, lot, a lot of you may know Tim Massey. He's our uh, camp commander there, a great historian in Greenville. He portrayed General Morgan. And uh, after the battle, uh, we laid him out there in the uh, best parlor there in the Dixon Williams Mansion, and uh, I bombed him. <laughs> <laughs> 150 years to the day, that General John Hunt Morgan was embalmed in that very room, and I thought, what a, what a unique thing, you know, how many people can say that they've done something like that. So I began to research it a little bit beforehand, put together a few things that. Uh, may have been used uh, in the Civil War era in bombing. Um, the hard, I will talk about one piece of equipment, which is the most important, and then I'll be finished. I, I don't want to go too long. But it's the pump. And the most common style of, there was three different kinds. Uh, there was a, a pump that acted like a piston, which you could uh, use the vacuum st uh, type of uh, equipment. Then there was also by gravity where they would pour the fluid into a vessel that hung up high and it would 
flow into the veins by gravity, or there was the hand pump method, and this is the most common. And all that you would simply do would, uh, just like the article said, they would open a vein, insert the tube into the vein, and with a hand pump, and it was a rubberized tube, um, they would just simply pump the embalming fluid, uh, you pump air into the vessel, the air would press the embalming fluid out through the tube and into the veins, and it would, uh, as it flowed through the veins, it would push the blood out and uh, replace it with the embalming fluid. And uh, it took about two hours, and that was it. It would just close off the vein and you'd be in good shape. So, uh, <laughs> so, so we decided. We decided. That if it works today, here's we can use it. did such a good job. He laid there and he didn't move a muscle. <laughs> he didn't move a muscle and, uh, and the people would say, he's looking real good. You know? And uh, I'd say, well, it's about through, you know, he's getting used to flexion back and all this. But, uh, but I was real proud of him until, until one lady that I guess he knew really, he had to know her pretty well for what she did. She came into the room and uh, she said, may I pay my respects to the gym? And I said, by all means, you know. And I was trying to remain in first person. You know, and uh, she came in and she kissed him on the forehead and he giggled a little bit. So I said, it's really bringing you life back. 